Hi guys, we're back with sessions 45 and today the topic of discussion is assessment from head to toe part 1 and you can go to dearnurses.com and find loads of helpful information. Let's start with our topics of discussion, assessment of the unresponsive patient, aspiration pneumonia, pupillary assessment, assessment of the patient with a spinal cord injury and central cord syndrome. Now let's start talking about an assessment of the unresponsive patient. Well, here is a nurse whose name is Carla, and she is in a hurry to go to lunch. Carla goes to her patient, Mr. Allen, and she tries to awaken him. And what does she say? She says, this is the second time I've offered you your pills. I will leave them so you can take them when you wake up. Well, that was wrong thinking to begin with. Why would you leave pills at the bedside when you do not know if someone can come along and take them? Secondly, did Carla ever do an assessment? No. But she proceeded to go to lunch. Now she's back, and guess what? The pills are missing. Any, as you might, it might be anyone's guess where these pills went off to. So take a look at dearnurses.com, assessment part, head of, from head to toe, part one, and you'll find helpful information on that topic. Next, we're going to talk about aspiration pneumonia. Any patient who's had a traumatic injury or for any reason cannot feed himself is likely to wind up on some kind of other nutrition, whether parenteral or enteral. What's most important is the patient on enteral nutrition has to be closely monitored because the possibility of aspiration pneumonia is always in the background. Some of the five things that we can do to avoid it are, of course, never forget to follow your doctor's instructions, always doctor's orders. But in your care plan, you know that you would include probably the potential for the risk for aspiration pneumonia. You follow the doctor's orders, head of bed up, 30 degrees. Then you must assess breathing also, lung sounds, in case there is feeding going into the lungs. And you must also take into account that abdominal distension might be part of the problem to a sign of uh, abdominal distension, if the stomach is too full, lay the patient down, it might wind up in the lungs. You also have orders to usually to check for residuals and the doctor usually lets you know if the residuals are greater than maybe sometimes 200 cc's or whatever he chooses, what you should do about it. Now let's talk about ocular, the ocular motor nerve. Now when you go to assess a patient's pupil, in the case of this patient, she's had a tumor resection. The nurse is assessing her pupils. The pupils constrict when light goes into the pupils. That is because the third cranial nerve, the ocular motor nerve, is the one that constricts the pupils. And there is a lot of helpful information on the, if you go to, again, dearnurses.com and look at cranial nerve assessment. You'll be able to see that there are many other nerves that originate in the brain which do different things. Now we're going to go on to spinal cord injury. and we all know that's not a very nice injury to have. Some people it's permanent and it's just really difficult both for the patient and the nurse. The healing is long, families involved, it's very very stressful. We know that depending on the part of the spine that's involved that's where you're going to get the damage that shows up. If it's high up in the C-spine from uh, above the third C3 you're going to wind up with a patient who may possibly need ventilatory support and um, you got C1 through 7 could be just weakness of the upper extremities and then I'm not going to go through everything because you can read it up and then you have the thoracic spine such injuries might involve strength of things like the abdominal muscles and as it gets lower down you get paralysis I guess of just the lower extremities whatever it is it's not a very nice situation and we're going to talk about central cord syndrome some people have heard of it, some people have not. This young man got his from a swimming pool. What happens typically in the patient who gets a spinal cord, a central cord syndrome, the opposite of what happens in typical spinal injuries happen. They have full ability to walk and their upper extremities are very weak. I have not seen it very often, but I've seen one or two cases of it. So again, I hope you've learned something please go to dearnurses.com assessment from head to toe and, uh, part one and see what you can information you can learn now 
if you go to sessions two, I brought this up because many times nurses overlook things that are very important. Most people don't want to have to face it, but feces is part of the human body. There's a lot you can learn from it. Even though most people don't want to have to deal with it, that's just life. If you would go to sessions two, you learn a horrific amount about feces, how important it is not to ignore. You have the pebbly type, of course, that's usually due to constipation, the tarry type when there's blood in the stools, that burgundy look. You may also have things like tube feeding, which turn and which are when patients have coloring. Now, I don't know that it's commonly used anymore, but if it is used, turns the stools green. Then you've got uh, when dye is put in the stool, it's usually what happens like a barium swallow. Patients have to go for like certain scans and stuff. They might come up with their stools looking white. So please take the trouble to learn some more of what might be most helpful to you. Have a great weekend. I hope you've enjoyed learning and stay posted for more clinical information. Have a good weekend.